We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone. Hello, greetings! I am Professor Jun Kahigal and welcome to another virtual lecture entitled Planetary Atmospheres. So in this virtual lecture, we will be comparing our atmosphere with the atmospheres of the other planets in the solar system, including Titan, since Titan is the only moon in the solar system with an atmosphere. Now, our atmosphere is thin and it extends only up to 150 plus kilometers. But still, even though the atmosphere is thin, it supports life on Earth. And with regards to its composition, our atmosphere is composed of the following gases. The most abundant gas in our atmosphere is nitrogen at about 78.3 percent okay this is followed by oxygen about 20.99 percent okay then we have carbon dioxide about 0.03 percent hydrogen 0.01 argon about 0.94 percent and other noble gases so that's the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. So the most abundant gas in our atmosphere is nitrogen, which is similar to Titan. Remember, Titan is the only moon in the solar system that has an atmosphere. And Titan's atmosphere is composed mostly of nitrogen, which is similar to our own atmosphere. Okay? And you have other gases like oxygen, argon, carbon dioxide, and other noble gases. Alright, so let's take a look at this pie chart showing the uh, composition of our atmosphere. So as you could see, the blue area represents nitrogen at around 78%. 
This is followed by the purple area of our pie chart for oxygen at about 20.9%. Then followed by the other gases like carbon dioxide 0.03% and other noble gases like argon at about 0.9%. Okay, so that's the composition of our atmosphere. Now, aside from these gases, there are also pollutants that are suspended in our atmosphere. Now, some of these primary pollutants in our atmosphere are as follows. So, we have carbon monoxide at about 49.1%. Then, we have nitrogen oxides at about 14.8%. Volatile organics at about 13.6%. And sulfur oxides at about 16.4%. Now, the sources of these primary pollutants are as follows. 46.2% comes from our transportation system. So, this includes the exhaust from buses, jeepneys, and automobiles. Also, we have industrial processes as a primary source of these pollutants at about 15%. And combustion from fuel at about 27.3%. So these pollutants are present also in our atmosphere. Now, what is the relationship between atmospheric pressure and altitude? Now, everybody kindly take a look at this graph showing the relationship between atmospheric pressure and altitude. Now, you will notice that as we increase in altitude, as we go higher, the atmospheric pressure decreases. Now, look at this. At sea level, you have 1,000 millibars of pressure. Now, as we increase in height, as we increase in altitude, or the higher we go, the atmospheric pressure decreases. Okay? So, the higher we go, the higher the altitude, the lesser is the atmospheric pressure. Now, what is the explanation behind this relationship that as we increase in altitude, the atmospheric pressure decreases? Now, in order to explain the relationship, we have to define first what air pressure is. Now, air is made up of molecules so air is matter and we know that matter is anything that occupies space and has weight now the air molecules are being pulled down by gravity so that is translated as weight so air has weight and the weight of the air above us is translated as air pressure so air pressure technically is the weight of the air and as the air molecules are being pulled down, the air becomes denser near the surface of the earth. Okay? So there are more molecules on the surface of the earth than above it. Okay? And that is translated as the weight of the air or air pressure. And the air pressure at sea level is one atmosphere or that's 1,000 millibars, or that is 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's the weight of the air above our heads. Now, that is really fascinating about the concept of atmospheric pressure. So again, when we say atmospheric pressure, that is the weight of the air above our heads. And the weight of the air is 14.7 pounds per square inch, or that is equivalent to one atmosphere, or about 1,000 millibars of pressure. Okay, so I guess we can move on now to the layers of the atmosphere. Now, even though our atmosphere is thin, our atmosphere is composed of the following layers. So, the layers of the atmosphere includes the troposphere, then above that is the stratosphere, then above the stratosphere is the mesosphere, 
Then above the mesosphere is the thermosphere. And if we could add above that is the exosphere. Okay? So those are the layers of the atmosphere in spite of the fact that our atmosphere is thin. And even though the atmosphere is thin, these layers of our atmosphere, they in a way contribute to the maintenance of life on Earth. Okay, so I guess we can now proceed to a detailed study of the layers of the atmosphere, starting off with the troposphere. Now, the troposphere is the closest layer to the surface of the Earth. And the troposphere ranges from zero, that's uh, at sea level, to 10 kilometers. And most of the weight or most of the mass of our atmosphere is in the troposphere. About 75 to 80 percent of the atmosphere or the mass of the air is in the troposphere. Now, in relation to this, most of the gases, including water vapor, they are located in the troposphere. And because of the amount of water vapor in the troposphere, clouds are found in the troposphere. And almost all weather activity occur in this layer of our atmosphere. Okay, so that's quite fascinating. So weather that includes storms, hurricanes, and other weather disturbances, they all occur in the troposphere. Now, in terms of temperature, now as we increase in altitude, the temperature of the troposphere decreases. Temperature decreases with an increase in altitude in the troposphere now that's the relationship between temperature and altitude in the troposphere so as we increase in altitude or height in the troposphere the temperature decreases so air temperature decreases with height in the troposphere now everybody can you take a look at this chart so as we increase in altitude up to 10 kilometers in height, the temperature decreases until it comes to a point that the temperature begins to stabilize. So with that, we hit that portion of the atmosphere called the tropopause. So the tropopause is the transition between the troposphere and the next layer of our atmosphere which is the stratosphere now above the tropopause is the stratosphere now again the tropopause is the boundary between the stratosphere and the troposphere wherein the temperature begins to stabilize now speaking of air the air in the stratosphere is stable with little turbulence and vertical mixing and also the air in the stratosphere is very dry resulting in an almost cloud free layer so if there are no clouds there's no weather in the stratosphere so there are no weather disturbances in the stratosphere now aside from the absence of clouds and weather disturbances in the stratosphere the stratosphere also contains the ozone layer now we know the extreme importance of the ozone layer in protecting our planet from harmful uv rays from the sun the ozone layer acts like a shield or a blanket that protects our planet from harmful uv rays from the sun and because of this ozone layer the earth became more conducive for the evolution of higher forms of life and also in the stratosphere as we increase 
in height, the temperature increases. Again, it has something to do with the ozone layer. Now, as the ozone layer absorbs UV rays, there is an increase in temperature. And that's the reason why as we increase in height in the stratosphere, the temperature increases. Now, everybody, I want you to take a look at this illustration showing the layers of our atmosphere. Now, everybody zoom in on the stratosphere. Now, the stratosphere extends from 10 kilometers up to 50 kilometers in height. And in the stratosphere, the air is dry. There is little or no water vapor. That means that clouds cannot form. And if there are no clouds, there are no weather disturbances, no storms, no hurricanes. And that's the reason why many of our commercial flights would cruise along the lower stratosphere. And our stratosphere also contains the ozone layer. The ozone layer shields us from harmful UV rays from the sun. And this makes the earth more conducive for the evolution of higher life forms. Okay, and also can you take a look at this chart showing a height and temperature. Now, in the stratosphere, as we increase in height or altitude, the temperature increases. This is due to the fact that as ozone absorbs UV rays from the sun, there is an increase in the kinetic energy of molecules, and that is translated as increase in heat or temperature. So, that is our stratosphere. Now, as we reach 50 kilometers in altitude, you will notice that in the chart, the temperature begins to stabilize. And that's a sign that we have reached the transition layer or the stratopause. The stratopause is a transition zone between the stratosphere and the layer above that, which is the mesosphere. Okay, so take note of the transition between the stratosphere and the mesosphere, that is the stratopause. Now, the layer above the stratopause is the mesosphere. Now, the mesosphere is that layer of the Earth's atmosphere above the stratosphere and below the thermosphere. And the mesosphere extends from about 50 kilometers in height up to 90 kilometers in height. And what is so special about the mesosphere is that most meteors, they burn up in the mesosphere. And we see them as shooting stars. So every time you see a shooting star, just think of it as a meteor that burns up in the mesosphere so shooting stars or meteors they burn up in that layer of our atmosphere and the mesosphere also is considered as the coldest layer of our atmosphere with temperatures plummeting to as low as negative 90 degrees celsius or about negative 130 degrees fahrenheit now, that is really fascinating about the mesosphere being the coldest layer of our atmosphere. The temperatures can even plummet down to negative 90 degrees Celsius to as low as negative 15 degrees Celsius. So, that's the mesosphere being the coldest layer of our atmosphere and also in the mesosphere meteors they burn up in that layer and we see them as shooting stars so every time you see a shooting star you think of that as a meteor burning up in the mesosphere okay and as we reach 90 kilometers in height or altitude the temperature begins to stabilize so that means that we have reached the transition zone called the mesopause. And above the mesopause is the next layer, which is the thermosphere. 
Now, the thermosphere extends from 100 kilometers in altitude up to 400 kilometers in altitude. Now, the word thermo means heat, and that implies that this layer of the atmosphere is the hottest layer, with temperatures reaching as high as 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And also, in this layer of the atmosphere, small meteorites, they burn up in this layer of the atmosphere. Now, everybody, I want you to zoom in on this chart, again, showing altitude and temperature. So, again, you will notice that as we increase in altitude from 90 kilometers up to 400 kilometers, the temperature in the thermosphere gradually increases. So, the thermosphere is the hottest layer of our atmosphere. And the International Space Station orbits the Earth in the thermosphere. Okay, so isn't that fascinating that the ISS or the International Space Station orbits the Earth in this layer of the atmosphere? Now, probably you might ask, Sir, I thought that the ISS and the other satellites, they orbit the Earth in outer space. Now, technically, the ISS and the other satellites, they are still with in the Earth's atmosphere. They are in the thermosphere. So, technically, they are still inside the Earth's atmosphere. So, is that outer space? Where does outer space begin? Now, what is our definition of space or outer space? Now, outer space begins with the Kármán line. A common definition of space is known as the Kármán line. The Kármán line is an imaginary boundary about 100 kilometers above sea level. So, in theory, once this 100 kilometer line is crossed, the atmosphere becomes too thin to provide enough lift for conventional aircraft to maintain flight. So the world governing body for aeronautics and astronautics uses the Kármán line to determine when space flight has been achieved. So once you have crossed the Kármán line, you are now technically in space or outer space. And the International Space Station orbits the Earth just above the Kármán line. Now, that's our definition of outer space. Once you have crossed that Kármán line about 100 kilometers above sea level, technically, you have reached outer space. Now, the International Space Station and most satellites orbiting our planet, they are just above the Kármán line. So, technically, the ISS and most satellites, they orbit the Earth in outer space now also in the thermosphere ultraviolet radiation interacts with the molecules in the thermosphere dissociating them and forming ions okay so the ultraviolet radiation causes photo ionization or photo dissociation of molecules creating ions so in the thermosphere you have a special layer called the ionosphere the ionosphere contains electrically charged particles in the thermosphere now since the ionosphere contains electrically charged particles this layer of the thermosphere acts like a mirror reflecting radio waves especially am radio waves or amplitude modulation waves so an am radio transmitter produces radio signals and these radio signals reaches the ionosphere the ionosphere reflects it back to earth and this is the reason why am programs they can be heard in very far places 
like for example DCRH or DCBB their radio programs can be heard even in Tawi-Tawi or even in the Babuyan Islands so that's how far radio programs especially AM radio programs can be heard they can reach very far places because the uh, signals, radio signals, once reaches the ionosphere, it is reflected back to Earth. So the ionosphere serves like a mirror reflecting AM signals back to Earth. Now because AM signals, once they reach the ionosphere, they are reflected back to Earth, static noise can be heard. So you would hear some hissing sounds in AM programs. That is due to the interaction of the radio signals with the electrically charged particles in the ionosphere. Hence, every time you listen to an AM program, you would hear some hissing sound. And that hissing sound is due to the interaction of radio signals with the electrically charged particles in the ionosphere. Now, unlike FM or frequency modulation, FM waves, they are of higher frequency, so they tend to penetrate the ionosphere. Okay? But FM signals, they can be picked up by communication satellites and these communication satellites, they retransmit the signals back to Earth. So since they don't interact with the electrically charged particles in the ionosphere, you won't listen to any hissing sound in an FM program. And this is the reason why, if you have noticed, most AM stations, they cater to news or radio drama than by playing music because of the hissing sounds in an AM broadcast, they somehow interfere with the quality of the music being played. Now, unlike FM, now since FM signals, they do not interact with the ionosphere, there is no hissing sound. That's why most FM stations, they play music and not really news or radio drama. So, isn't that fascinating indeed? And lastly, the electrically charged particles in the ionosphere interacts with the solar wind. And when that happens, the interaction of the solar wind with the ionosphere produces those dazzling lights in the north and in the south pole, which we call as the auroras. So in the north, we have the aurora borealis, and in the south, we have the Aurora Australis. Now, these auroras or dazzling lights, they are created by the interaction with the solar wind and the electrically charged particles in the ionosphere. So, those are the layers of our atmosphere. So, the layers of the atmosphere, they are not determined by height or altitude. But the layers of the atmosphere, they are determined by temperature. So, everybody, kindly take a look again at this chart showing height or altitude and temperature. So, in the troposphere, as we increase in altitude, the temperature decreases until we reach the tropopause. Then from there, we reach the stratosphere. You will notice that as we increase in height in the stratosphere, temperature increases until we hit the stratopause. Then from there, in the mesosphere, the temperature plummets down to minus 90 degrees and reaching the mesopause. Then from there, in the thermosphere, temperature increases up to 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the thermosphere. As we increase in altitude, the temperature increases. So that's how the layers of the atmosphere are determined. It is temperature and not height.
Now, before we end, it is very important that we need to mention the greenhouse effect. Now, the greenhouse effect is that phenomenon in our atmosphere wherein our atmosphere receives radiation from the sun. But somehow, that radiation in the form of heat gets trapped by water vapor and gases like carbon dioxide and methane. Now, carbon dioxide and methane, these are the so-called greenhouse gases. So, these gases, they allow radiation from the sun in the form of heat to reach planet Earth. But these gases, they tend to trap the heat, keeping the heat within the Earth. Okay? So, that's the greenhouse effect. Parang ano po ito? Parang yung kotse na nakasarado po yung mga bintana, then the car is left under the sun. So, in a few minutes, umiinit po yung loob ng kotse. Now, that is the greenhouse effect. Okay? So, the greenhouse effect is that phenomenon in our atmosphere wherein radiation from the sun in the form of heat reaches the earth. But because of these greenhouse gases, the heat gets trapped inside the earth's atmosphere. Okay? Now, there are advantages and disadvantages of the greenhouse effect. Now, one advantage of the greenhouse effect is that the greenhouse effect helps regulate global temperature, which is vital in the maintenance of life on Earth. So, in a way, the greenhouse effect is beneficial because it regulates global temperature. Now, one disadvantage of the greenhouse effect is that as the volume of greenhouse gases is increasing with more burning of fossil fuels, it is contributing to an increase in the planet's average temperature and climate. And this is what we call as global warming. Now, because of this increase in greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels, this will increase the planet's average temperature and climate, resulting in what we call as global warming. Okay, so I guess that's about it for the greenhouse effect and the layers of our atmosphere. Now, at this point, let us now compare our atmosphere with the atmosphere of the other planets in the solar system. So, let us now compare our atmosphere with the Venusian atmosphere. Now, we know from the previous live stream entitled The Tour of the Solar System, we know that the Venusian atmosphere is extremely thick. And the composition of the Venusian atmosphere is that it is composed mostly of carbon dioxide. And because of the thickness of the Venusian atmosphere, an astronaut would experience air pressure at about 90 times heavier than the Earth's atmospheric pressure. So it is like diving about 3,000 feet beneath the ocean. So that's how extensive the Venusian atmospheric pressure is as compared to the Earth's atmospheric pressure. Now, isn't that fascinating because of the thickness of the Venusian atmosphere, the Venusian air pressure is 90 times greater than the atmospheric pressure here on Earth. So, if you're an astronaut on Venus, it is like diving at 3,000 feet beneath the ocean. So, that's how extensive the Venusian atmospheric pressure is as compared to the Earth's atmospheric pressure. Also, because of the composition of the Venusian atmosphere, which is mostly carbon dioxide, the Venusian atmosphere causes a runaway greenhouse effect that heats the planet even hotter than the surface of Mercury. Now, because the Venusian atmosphere is composed mostly of carbon dioxide, 
And we know that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. The heat from the sun is allowed to enter the Venusian atmosphere, but it does not allow it to escape, raising the surface temperature of Venus to about 460 degrees Celsius, making Venus the hottest planet in the solar system, much even hotter than Mercury. Now that is really fascinating about this runaway greenhouse effect on Venus. Now everybody, I want you to take a look at this photo taken by the Venera space probe. So you will notice that the sky, the Venusian sky is yellow. Now it's because the Venusian clouds are composed of sulfuric acid. So take note, sulfuric acid. So the thick clouds of Venus is composed of sulfuric acid. So if you will describe the atmosphere of Venus, Venus is one hell of a planet. Well, I guess that's it for the hellish atmosphere of Venus. So let us now compare our atmosphere with the Martian atmosphere. Now, in terms of thickness, the Martian atmosphere is about 100 times thinner than the Earth's atmosphere. And it is composed mostly of carbon dioxide at about 95%. Now, here is the breakdown of the composition of the Martian atmosphere. So, carbon dioxide at about 95.32%. Nitrogen at about 2.7%, argon at about 1.6%, and oxygen at about 0.13%. And we have also carbon monoxide at about 0.08%. Now, that's really fascinating about the Martian atmosphere. So, the Martian atmosphere is 100 times thinner as compared to the Earth's atmosphere. And the Martian atmosphere is composed mostly of carbon dioxide, similar to Venus. But because of the thinness of the Martian atmosphere, there is no runaway greenhouse effect. Other gases in the Martian atmosphere include argon, nitrogen, and other gases. Okay, so that's the composition of the Martian atmosphere. Now, even though the Martian atmosphere is thin and about 100 times thinner than the Earth's atmosphere, it is thick enough to support clouds, weather, and wind. Now, that's really fascinating. Even though the Martian atmosphere is thin, it is thick enough to support weather, winds, and clouds. In fact, the Martian atmosphere has giant dust devils. These dust devils, they are like twisters that routinely kick up the oxidized iron dust that covers the Martian surface. And also, the Martian atmosphere has dust storms. These dust storms are the largest in the solar system, capable of blanketing the entire planet and lasting for months. These usually take place in the spring or during the Martian summer. Now, remember the movie The Martian? So, at the start of the movie, the Mars crew encountered a giant dust storm. So they were forced to evacuate the habitat. Okay, so Mars experiences these giant dust storms and these dust storms may enshroud the entire planet. And that's really fascinating indeed about the red planet. Well, I guess that's it for the Martian atmosphere. Really interesting indeed. Now, what about the four gas planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune? 
Now, their atmospheres are similar in composition. The most abundant gas in their atmospheres is hydrogen followed by helium with traces of methane and ammonia. But in the case of Uranus and Neptune, the amount of methane is much greater as compared to Jupiter and Saturn. And that accounts for their bluish appearance in their atmospheres. Now, what about Titan? Titan is the largest moon of Saturn. And Titan is the only moon in the solar system that has an atmosphere. Now, the atmosphere of Titan is quite fascinating indeed because Titan's atmosphere, based from the observations from the Voyager space probe, have shown that the Titanian atmosphere is denser as compared to the Earth's atmosphere. And the atmosphere of Titan is so thick and the gravity is so low that humans could fly through it by flapping wings attached to their arms. Fantastic, isn't it? Now, since the Titanian atmosphere is thick, will that affect the pressure on Titan's atmosphere? Okay, now in terms of the atmospheric pressure on Titan, at the surface of Titan, the atmospheric pressure is about 60% greater than on Earth. Roughly the same pressure a person would feel swimming about 50 feet. Okay, so that's fascinating indeed. And in terms of composition, the Titanian atmosphere is mostly nitrogen at about 95% and methane at about 5% with small amounts of other carbon-rich compounds such as ethane and propane. So basically, the troposphere of Titan's atmosphere is similar to the troposphere of the Earth's atmosphere. If you will recall, in the troposphere here on Earth, weather occurs. So you have water vapor, water vapor turns into clouds, and clouds bring precipitation like rain or snow. So that's the troposphere here in the Earth's atmosphere. But on Titan, the troposphere of the Titanian atmosphere, you have methane rain. So there's no water vapor. So you have methane rain, haze rain out, and also there are clouds that are found in the Titanian troposphere. And that's fascinating indeed. Now, what about the Titanian stratosphere? Now, the composition of the Titanian stratosphere is 98% nitrogen, the only dense, rich nitrogen atmosphere in the solar system aside from the Earth's atmosphere, with the remaining 1.6% composed mostly of methane, that's about 1.4% methane, and hydrogen at about 0.1% and 0.2 percent now for the mesosphere the titanian mesosphere the titanian mesosphere is a detached haze layer which is found at about 400 to 500 kilometers within the mesosphere and in the titanian mesosphere the temperature at this layer is similar to that of the thermosphere because of the cooling of hydrogen cyanide lines. And we have the titanium thermosphere. Now, particle production begins in the thermosphere. Now, this was concluded after finding and measuring heavy ions and particles. So, again, you will notice that the thermosphere on Titan's atmosphere has ions which is similar to the thermosphere of the Earth's atmosphere. All right? And this is also the Cassini's closest approach in Titan's atmosphere. Now, everybody, kindly take a look 
at this illustration comparing the Earth's atmosphere with the Titanian atmosphere. So you will notice, just like here on Earth, the Titanian atmosphere has layers. So you have the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the thermosphere. And just like in the Earth's atmosphere, the Titanian troposphere is that layer wherein most of the weather on Titan occurs. And in the Titanian troposphere, you have methane clouds and methane rain. Now, back here on Earth, in the troposphere, you have water vapor. Water vapor forms clouds and clouds form rain. Okay, on Titan, water cannot exist in liquid form because of its low temperature. But on Titan, there is liquid in the form of liquid methane. So you have on Titan, methane clouds and methane rain. Now, in the Titanian atmosphere, most of the nitrogen and the other gases are in the stratosphere. Now, unlike here on Earth, most of the gases here on Earth are in the troposphere. Now, in Titan, the stratosphere contains most of the gases like nitrogen, methane, and the other gases. And just like here on Earth, the electrically charged particles or ions are in the thermosphere. That's why here on Earth, the thermosphere has a layer within it called the ionosphere. Now, that's very similar to the Titanian atmosphere. The electrically charged particles are also suspended in the Titanian thermosphere. So, that's really fascinating indeed. So, there are similarities between the Titanian atmosphere and the Earth's atmosphere. Now, because of the similarities between the Earth's atmosphere and the Titanian atmosphere, plus the fact that Titan has liquid on its surface, but not liquid water, but liquid methane, Titan is a good candidate for the existence of extraterrestrial life. So, isn't that fascinating indeed? Now, the Huygens probe discovered liquid methane. And probably within those lakes of methane, microbial life in the form of extremophiles or methanogen may exist. So, we are looking forward for other missions on Titan that may confirm the existence of life on that fascinating moon of Saturn. Okay, so that's the Cassini probe. The Cassini probe was able to reach the thermosphere of Titan. And the Huygens probe successfully landed on the surface of Titan. Well, I guess that's about it for our topic tonight on planetary atmospheres. Now, it is vital that we compare the atmospheres of the planets, including Titan, so that in a way we can protect our own atmosphere. So, we need to protect our own atmosphere by lessening the carbon dioxide content of our atmosphere in order to minimize global warming. Or else, if we don't stop burning those fossil fuels and continually increasing the carbon dioxide content of our atmosphere, our planet may end up like Venus with one hellish landscape and its hellish atmosphere. So we need to protect and maintain our atmosphere. Okay, so I guess that's all for tonight. So I would like to thank the officers and crew of the Bedan Society of Young Astronomers to my president, Mr. J.C. Cascolan, my head director, Mr. Kuz Pakulanan, and also, I would like to thank the administrators of San Beda University Senior High School Department who made this live stream possible. Please check out our Facebook page, the Bedan Society of Young Astronomers. And also, please check out our Twitter account. Alright, so I guess that's about it. This is your commander, Professor Jun Kahigal, saying, Live long and prosper and i will see you soon always stay safe and good night everybody we 
choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone. 